so today, today I got an interesting topic I want to share with you all. Uh, something that I think is is near and dear to my heart, and uh, I want to share it with you because um, it's going to be something that's near and dear to your heart as well. Uh, just as far as once you get an understanding of it, one of the things that I deal with often as a pastor and uh, dealing prophetically with with what is God saying concerning a certain topic, uh, concerning a, a certain. Uh, situation you know what is God saying about my life what is he saying about my ministry what is he saying about um, you know whatever what, what, what is God saying concerning me and so one of the teachings that's going to be coming up I, I, I may be doing this tomorrow which is Wednesday uh, Wednesday night encounter uh, if the Holy Spirit permits because we want to follow we got to follow the Holy Ghost and and, and whatever we do um, but but today I want to talk about something that you probably haven't haven't heard a, a, a pastor talk on enough, but prayers that God can't answer. And I know this probably goes against some of your theology because they'll say, is there anything that anything too hard for God? Is there anything that God can't do? Yeah, there, there actually, there's, there's a few things God can't do. God can't fail. God can't sin. God can't go against his word. All right? He can't fail. He can't sin. He can't lie. He cannot go against his word. Going against his word is a lie. And because that's not who God is, he's never going to do it. And so I, I want to just talk about four things today. Um, and, and, and these are just four examples. And these four examples are going to spread abroad in your life. And it's going to give you greater clarity on just where you are and, and, and what prayers God cannot answer. What prayers God cannot um, respond to in your life? What is it about your life that, uh, that that God cannot do? He cannot answer. He cannot speak concerning. Um, and so just four of them, and, and I pray it blesses you. I know it will. Um, and when we hear this stuff, we got we to gotta go word on it. We got to go the Bible. Now, I know, of course, before I get in this, there's the superficial, probably heard it in the churches growing up. You know, God, ain't gonna, he's not going to give you a, answer your prayer to give you somebody else's wife, to give you somebody else's husband. To, you know, we, we, that's, that's should be obvious. And if it's not obvious to you, I, I, I don't have to give you any Bible on that. It's just full out sin. God does not condone adultery. So you can't be praying for somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. He's not going to do it for you. You also can't pray that God protects you while you continue to sin. That's another thing that you cannot do. Grace uh, it's not that God has just been protecting you. God has been giving you grace to get it right, all right? It's not like, oh, God, protect me while I finish this drug deal. Protect me while I continue prostitution. Protect me while I illegally, you know, do what I want to do and completely disrespect your word. It's not that. Um, also, you know, God, protect me while, you know, I do something I know is damaging to me. That's That's not who God is. That's going against your word. It's going against the Holy Spirit and asking God to protect you while you disobey him. That's not him. And those are some of the more blatant and obvious ones. But I want to go with, with a couple of uh, with, with some other ones here in Scripture and, and hopefully give you some clarity. Um, number one, one of the prayers I hear often is, I'm going to go through this one fast. You should know this one. But sometimes people don't. One of the prayers I hear often is people say, you know, oh, God, I'm just asking you to be with me today, God. Um, lead me today, God. And those are pray that's a prayer that God can answer. When you're asking God, be with me today, God literally cannot answer that prayer. This is why. Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews uh, 13 and 5. Uh, I'm not going to have the scriptures on the screen today because I have too many verses. So I was like, I'm not going to be trying to click through all these verses. Uh, you just got to have your Bible. Oh, oh, you know, this devotion time anyways, right? You need to have, need to have a word, you know, um, in front of you. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Uh, it's actually for lay argua in the Greek. Keep your, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now, I'm not even going to teach on the love of money or being content, even though there's a lesson that many of us are, are having to learn right now with being out of work for many of us and, and, and finances not being able to stretch as they used to be able to stretch. And many of us are having to deal with the fact of do we have a love and affinity, a longing for money, and, or have we, have we learned to be content with what we have? But that's not even my lesson. We need to be content with what we have, but that's not what I'm focused on today. He's saying, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. 
Now, that's a verse you've heard often and probably heard it quoted many times in church. But once you realize if God has said, I'll never leave you and never will I forsake you, then that means it is an illegal prayer to say, God, be with me today. It's a prayer that God can't answer. It's a prayer that oftentimes, once you get done praying, you will see God sitting in silence because he cannot go against his word. Neither can he answer a prayer, that he, a promise he's already promised. He can't, can't reiterate something he's already said. This is why it's important for you to know your word. Once you understand that God has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, then asking God to be with us today is a waste of time. It's a waste of your prayer time. It's a waste of your energy. And if you're not careful, you'll be stuck in this place of, of, of inertia, almost or it's a lack of movement, simply because you're waiting on God to respond to a prayer he cannot answer. All right. I, I got three more. It's only, only going to get better and better. Um, a se second one, number two. I, this one over here. I've heard this in church my whole life, and I want to fix it today. This prayer, I must decrease that he may increase. Oh, this, ah, must decrease. Oh, hallelujah. That he may increase. All right, so now that you've done, had, done having your spiritual moment, you're going to realize that that Bible, that verse there is only quoted one time, and it's quoted by John the Baptist. It is quoted by John the Baptist, and hear me, it is not supposed to be quoted by you, by a kingdom believer, or by a believer that is hidden in Christ. Please hear me. John the Baptist had quoted this, and he was saying this because he was the premier authority of his day. John the Baptist was the one that they received as a prophet. As a matter of fact, Many of the people at this day believe that John was a prophet more than they believe Jesus was a prophet. They saw John fasting. They didn't know his previous life. He was hidden and tucked away in the wilderness. So then when he came out, he came out in power and in fire. He ate locusts and wild honey. He, he, he knew the word. You hear me? He came out saying, repent. He wasn't at weddings. He wasn't at birthday parties. He wasn't at gatherings. He wasn't at family reunions. He only cared about God. And they respected that. They're like, ooh, we love John, John the Baptist. That's why there's an entire uh, denomination that, that primarily focuses on him. It's the Baptist, all right? It's John. They loved him. I mean, people said he was saved. He was anointed. And so John the Baptist realized a few points when Jesus came on the scene. He said, there's a man who comes after me who's so powerful. I'm not even worthy to be called his slave. He's so anointed. Hear me that I can't even carry and untie his sandals. I'm not worthy of that. He said, this man is coming. I came with the water and with repentance, but this man, this prophet, this son of God is coming with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He's going to baptize you in the anointing. And what he said is this. He said, listen, it's critical for you guys to stop giving me so much influence. It's critical that God pulls me away. I must decrease that he may increase. This is what John is saying. My ministry must diminish because God is getting ready to flourish and to launch his ministry. I feel a preach anointing on me. I, I, I must come back. There are, there, are, there are things that God is pulling back in my ministry because the ministry of Jesus needs to grow and people need to see the importance of his influence. So I, I thank y'all that you guys honor who it is that I am and that y'all honor my ministry. But to be honest, my ministry was only partial in that my ministry was to get you to see the error of your ways. My ministry was to get you to see where you had made mistakes. My ministry was to get you to see where you had failed. My ministry was to get you to see where there were issues in your life and sacrifice that needed to be made. You needed to go into the water. You needed to be baptized. You needed to, you needed repentance. You needed to be forgiven. But Jesus, the man that's coming after me, it ain't just about your repentance. He'll take care of that. He'll take care of your forgiveness. The man that's coming after me, it's bringing something that I cannot give you. He's bringing the anointing. He's bringing the Holy Ghost 
and he's bringing fire, the purifying fire, the consuming fire of God. So watch this. So thank God that he's given me an assignment, but I must decrease. That's why John the Baptist's ministry only lasted six months because he came screaming, repent for the, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus came and said, watch this. I am the kingdom of God. So, so John came to tell y'all to repent because the kingdom of God was coming. But when I showed up on the scene, I, I brought the kingdom with me. I brought the Holy Ghost and the fire and the anointing with me. So it wasn't just about the kingdom coming. Watch this. The kingdom of God is here. But John was saying the ministry of introduction had to decrease now that the book is here. Maybe you missed it. John was coming to introduce the word, but Jesus was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. That's what it was when they did not have the word of God. They had to follow the introduction. But when the word of God came, when God brought the word through Moses and the law and the prophets and the, the New Testament apostles, when he brought the word, he said, now I've given you instruction. You are no longer in introduction phase. Now I've given you my voice and my word to be able to follow. So what I need you to do is stop praying, God, I, I must increase that, you, that, you, that he may increase. No, what he needs you to do is increase increase and let him increase in you. See, this is what he said. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly, which means that when he came into your life, he needed you to increase. He needed you to go up. Listen, if he's going to give you a greater abundance, it means it is increased. As a matter of fact, every single thing about the kingdom life is about increase. It's about increase. It's about bringing forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. He he said again that no man has given up anything for the kingdom that should not receive now in this time 100 fold of the very thing that he sowed. That is increased. Jesus literally said that the enemy came that he may steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come. Watch this. Not so you can decrease. Bring it back up. I have come that you may increase, that you may have life and life more abundantly. I did not come for you to go down. I know it sounds spiritual. I know it sounds religious. I know it sounds good. I know it may feel good emotionally because it sounds like something they're supposed to say. But what the kingdom of God represents is that when Jesus came on the scene, he said, I have come that you might have have life, watch this, but not just life, but life more abundantly. The word of God, God declares in 3rd John, he said, beloved, I wish above all things. This is what I pray more than anything else in my life. This is what I'm praying for more than anything else you can imagine. This is what I'm praying for more than anything else you can fathom in your heart. This is what I'm praying for more than anything else you can sense in your spirit. I pray, I'm seeking God I'm, that you may be increased. I'm, I'm seeking God that you may prosper and be in hell even as your soul prospers. Guess what? That's increase. See, that's why he's coming. Come on, he's coming from in for increase. Come on, kosher. He's coming for in increase. Yes, he 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 hear me. He he's not just, you know, this modest thing that makes you feel good about saying, you know, and, and God just, I'm just, I'm decreasing. That, that, that he may increase. I must decrease. See, I know this sounds spiritual, but all of you should have been dead anyways. Because as Galatians said, you've already crucified the flesh alone, this affections and his lusts. She said in Galatians 2 and 20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It ain't even about me no more. See, the old me should have already decreased to the grave. But the new me, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hallelujah. Old things are passed away. Behold. All things are made new. And guess what? God needs the new me to increase. He needs the new identity, the new purpose to increase. I know it sounds good to say you must decrease because that's religious. But in relationship, God is saying you must increase so that people will see the increase of the Lord, so they will see the increase of the kingdom. God wants you more blessed. 
He wants you to let more about the spirit. He wants you to walk in more power. He wants you to walk in more faith. Come on. He wants you to walk in more peace. He wants you to walk in more love. He wants you to walk in more forgiveness. He wants you to walk, walk in more health. He wants you to walk in more healing. He wants you to walk in more purity. He wants you to walk in more truth. Hallelujah. He wants you to increase, child of God. God wants you. Listen to me, sister. Listen to me, brother. God wants you to increase. And don't ever let anybody else tell you anything differently. God wants you to increase. Hear me. He wants Wants you to increase, not decrease, go up. It's not for you to go down now that God is here. That's the voice of the enemy now that God is here. He wants you to increase. He wants you to go up. He wants to see more in your life. All right. Number two. I mean, number three. All right. So that's one thing God can't answer your prayer of saying, God be with us. He can't answer this false humility prayer of I must de decrease that he may increase real humility is saying God I'm not even worth the increase in my, I, might, I mean I'm not worth forgive me I may not deserve the increase but I'm worth the increase I may not deserve it but because you said I was worth it that I, 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 I increase but I carry my humility with me I don't put myself on a pedestal the only person I lift up is Jesus all right but it's not this false humility where you got to stay poor and meek and with nothing. And that somehow, some way gives glory to God. No, God wants you to increase. He wants you to increase in, flu in influence. He wants you to increase in favor. The Bible says that we're supposed to grow in favor with God and man. Which means that God wants you to grow in influence. Because the bigger your influence, the more people God can reach through you. That's not for everybody. That word went, woo. That was not for everybody. That was only for a few of you. That God needs to grow your increase. He needs your name to mean more. He needs your value to mean more. Because the larger your increase, the larger your reach. It's not about being famous. It's about having a longer reach. It's about being able to influence people for Jesus and for the kingdom of God. It's not an arrogant, self-increasing, bumptious, you know, um, superfluous attitude where you think you're just better than other people. It's not that it's about God. I realize you have given me a platform and you've given me a stage. And I realize that about myself. The guy's given me a platform. He's given me a stage because he wants to use me. He has increased me because he wants to use my increase for the increase of his kingdom. And I'm willing to say, God, whatever platform you give to me, hallelujah, this feels better than you probably saying, man, God, whatever platform you give to me, I will use this platform to increase and to share the love of Jesus, to share the love of God. Some of you guys have have thousands of followers and, and a lot of people like you and they love you and instead of using your influence why does this preach feel like this it feels different right here instead of using your influence to, to, to share TikTok videos and instead of using your influence to share negative uh, negative things instead of using your influence to lead people in the wrong direction how about using your influence to steer people back towards God and I'm not here to knock it like God wants you to have fun you TikTok and you dance and you doing all of that but sometimes we use our influence for everything, but we use our influence to sell clothes, to sell weave, to be influencers, to sell makeup, to do tutorials, and all that stuff is fine. God is good. God has given you an ability to influence. But what about using your reach? But what about using your influence for the glory of God? I realize that God has given me reach. I realize that God has given me influence. God has given me influence into the area of barbering, and here God's given me influence into the NBA. And what I'm doing is using my reach, using my influence. To glorify the kingdom. What are you using your influence for? I don't went all off scale right here, but I got to share this. What are you using your influence for? If God is giving your name value in the earth and people respect your name, they respect your voice. Are you too ashamed of God to share kingdom with your influence? Do you not even recognize that it's shame? Do you not even recognize that you're nervous to share your faith? I mean, you'll repost somebody else's post. You'll repost the, but God saying the nah, bigger, you know, hash mark God. You, you'll share that. But what about you? What about you saying intimately, hey, Jesus is everything to me. God saved my life from a broken state. God changed me. Or is your devotion to God private only? Are you only devoted in your room, in your house? When the Bible says that let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. The God that sets you in the city set upon a hill 
that cannot be hidden. If you have a hidden relationship, it's a shamed relationship. You don't want to be with nobody who's ashamed to say they're with you. You don't want to be with anybody who's ashamed to say that they love you, who's ashamed to say that they care about you, who's ashamed. My wife would not want to be with me if every time I went in public, I took my ring off. If every time I went in public, I pretended to be single. If every time I went in public, I pretended like my options were still open. But that's what some of us are doing, right? Some of us pretend like our options are open once we're in public. Once nobody's around, you know, it's... This feels so, man, it's the Holy Spirit. And then once I get in public, it's, it's you know, my options are open. I'm single. Flirting with the enemy and then acting surprises when he kisses me. Like pretending like I'm on that side when I'm on God's side. Instead of using my influence, instead of using that same cry, because when it's in private, it's God, I need you. When it's in private, it's God, protect my family. When it's in private, it's God, you, it's you and me. But when it's in public, it's only about you. But what about using your influence to draw people back to Jesus? There's somebody needed that today. Man, I feel that. I feel that heavy, all right? Because some of you guys are walking in shame with God and don't even know it. Because you're, you're, you're afraid to talk about it. You're afraid to post. You're afraid to share it. Maybe you're afraid of people coming against your beliefs. Maybe you're afraid of people talking about you. But that means that you care about their opinion more than you care about God's. Your father's. Number three, all right. Um, another thing that another prayer that God can answer is the prayer against what He's called you to do. So I'm not going to go over all of this, but if you go to Matthew, the last one was John three to thirty, uh, three and thirty. For those who are asking, he he must become greater. Um, he must I must inc- uh, decrease that he may increase. That's John three and thirty. But my next one is Matthew twenty six and thirty nine. Matthew 26 and 39. Um, and, it's, and it goes through verse 46. And I'm just read a few of it. I'm, and then just explain my points. I'm not going to teach every verse. But it says, He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So many of you understand, remember this story. This is when Jesus came and was praying, Father, take away. Um, take away this cup. Take away, I don't I, I know this suffering was getting ready to happen. And it says, um, verse 40 says, Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he says to Peter, Couldn't you watch me even one hour? I got a whole lesson on this, but I can't teach you that right now. Verse 41, he says, Keep watch and pray so that you were not given to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Verse 42, Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Verse 43, when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things. And then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. Now, I I need you to pay attention to this. Jesus um, has never had a time in his life where he could not get through to God. Ever. Go read your Bible. There was never a time where Jesus questioned if the Father heard him. Not even once. There was always this sure and confident um, belief, this sure and confident expectation. There was always this sure and confident just knowing that God was with him. He just knew it. He just Every time he prayed, when he raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11, he was just like, Father, I thank you that you hear me. I know you always hear me. You always do. But here we find a different version of Jesus. We find Jesus getting ready to be crucified the next day. So this this is within the next 24 hours. So his emotions, his flesh is starting to get to him. He's here in this place and he's praying to God three times over and over and over. Praying, 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 praying. And while he's praying, he's not getting an answer. God, let this cup pass. The Bible said he prayed it three times. We've never seen Jesus pray the same prayer three times. Hear me. He wasn't praying the same prayer three times when he was raising people from the dead. He wasn't praying the same prayer three times when he was casting out demons. He wasn't praying the same prayer three times when he was healing the sick. He wasn't praying the prayer the same time three times when he was you know, curing diseases and cleansing lepers. 
I mean, he was making limbs come back. I mean, that was that was stuck, being able to function, arms that were born deformed, becoming normal. And it was always with the power of God, it was with an anointing command. He just knew it. But here, when it came time to something that was difficult, it was a temptation that was for himself. He's asking God and he's not getting an answer. Because number three, God cannot answer when you are asking him to change his will. All right? God cannot answer when you are asking him to change his will. Some of y'all know that y'all called to preach and you think if you pray enough, God going to change his mind. That's why you feel distant. That's why you feel like you can't hear. That's why you feel like maybe God is not speaking. You want to know why? Because you're praying a prayer he cannot answer. All right? If God calls you to ministry, you have to do it. It's not going to change his will. And if you don't do it, you can live and, and live your life as you want to. But you are never going to hear God augment his decision about you. Hallelujah. This feels better than you typing amen. <laughs> are you listening to me? You are never going to you are never going to see God change his his decision about you. If he calls you a, a intercessor, if he's called you a preacher, a prophet, an apostle, a pastor, evangelist, a leader, some of you guys right now are distant from God. Not because God wants to be distant from you, but because you refuse to accept his decision about you. God said, Find other thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you and expect it in. And it's good as you've given your life back to God. It's good as you've been back focused on your relationship with him. But when will you be back focused on your assignment? When will you be back focused on your cup? Jesus said, God, I don't want this cup. But God has given all of us a cup. Come on. Come on. Every single last one of us, we have a cup. Every single one of us, there is a cup in our life that we must drink. And, there, and, and, and for all of us, there will be a cup that we don't want to drink. We don't want to. There are times where God was showing me this is going to happen. You are going to be betrayed by loved ones. You're going to be betrayed by friends and family. Like this is going to happen. And I'm like, I don't want that cup. Like, like we are literally trying to exchange our cup. Like, no, 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 God, you take the big cup back. I want the sippy cup. <laughs> you hear me? It's too much at one time. Like, like, you know, that's what kids, kids get a sippy cup because they can't handle too much at one time. Like, you're like, God, this, I feel like this is too much. Here, here, here's your cup back and here's my sippy cup, right? I want this because it's easier for me to deal with. It is easier for me to handle. I don't want the difficulty of the moment. I don't want to actually deal with what you're telling me to deal with. Here, take back this cup. I, I, I don't want this cup. I, I'm praying that this cup may pass. I'm praying and what you have called me to do may pass. I'm praying. When I first realized that God called me to preach, I didn't want to do it. Man, you don't know me. I did not want to do it. I fought with it. It took for my mom to literally grab me and say, you can't run from your assignment. Thank God for praying, mamas. You can't run from your assignment. And I still didn't listen. And so I went home and I prayed. And I'm like, God, if, if I just must do this, then show me a sign. And every single time I would open my Bible, that's when I had a paper Bible, not this fancy tablet, iPad stuff. When I had an old-fashioned paper Bible with a name engraved in it in gold. You know what I'm talking about? I, 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 I had a Bible. And every single time I opened the Bible, every time it was opening up to verses talking about stepping into ministry. And I've called you. And I've called you and I've called you and I've called you. And I'm like, I didn't know it was this many verses that talked about calling and talked about ministry. And I so badly see some people wanted to preach and that's all they wanted to do. Ooh, there was that harsh dream. I mean, they emailing people right now about getting in somebody's pulpit. They want to preach and that's cool. Like, if that's your desire, I'm not knocking. I'm excited that you have a desire to fulfill the kingdom. That's actually a blessing. But for me, that wasn't the cup I wanted. I wanted to be the church musician, right? The drummer and the piano player. Because, like, you know, you know, it's, a, it's an unspoken truth that most people know the musicians in church, you know, they, most of them have saved. They believe in God, but lifestyle don't really mean. And, I mean, it's to the point where people don't even expect musicians to really have a lifestyle. It's just like most of them aren't minstrels. We, we have very few minstrels today. We have a lot of talent, but very few minstrels. Because it's funny for them to be gifted and not be anointed. To have a charisma, but not have the Holy Ghost. 
So it's different. I'm talking about, I, I was cool with that. That's the sippy cup. Just enough church to get me by. Just enough God to believe that if he come, I might be able to make it happen. Just enough. But I did not want the cup where God was telling me, I want to kill all of Kenny so that the new Kenny that I have called to stand up in his assignment, his purpose can be lived out. I want to kill that old you, that old esteem, that old arrogance, that old confidence, that old fleshly desire. And I want to give you the cup that I have for you. But I didn't want that cup. Man, I'm being real right here. This is transparent, right? This is true. We are a true church. Transparent, real, unedited. I didn't want that cup. I'm like, that's that's somebody else. My dad was a pastor. My mama was, was co-pastor with him. And I've been I was raised in church. And I'm like, I don't want that. That's too much. People want, want preachers and pastors to do too much. I ain't with all that. It's too, it's too many expectations. It's just too many. I don't want none of it. The whole time. Let me tell you, can I give you one more? Can I come on? Can I give you a word? Can I give you a word? Hallelujah. There has never been anybody in scripture who got the cup that God wanted for them and thought they were ready. <laughs> Hallelujah. There has never been anybody in the scripture who, when they got the cup, thought they were ready. Abram didn't think he was ready. Listen, Isaac didn't think he was ready. Jacob, Joseph didn't think he was ready. Moses said, God, I got a speech impediment. I'm not ready. Joshua said, God, I'm young. I'm not ready. God to say, Joshua, be courageous. Daniel thought I wasn't ready. David, when God anointed him to be king, when he was hiding in his father's backyard, thought I'm not ready. Solomon said, God, I'm too young. I need wisdom. I'm not ready. The prophet Isaiah said, Lord, I'm a man that live in a country of unclean lips. I'm not ready. Jeremiah said, God, I'm way too young. They despise my youth. I'm not ready. Peter had some issues in his flesh. He said, I'm not ready. Paul said, I persecuted the church. I'm not ready. Timothy said, Paul, you started this. I'm just a new pastor. I'm not ready. Every single person in the Bible, when God gave them their cup, Thought they weren't ready. Even Jesus, when it was time to drink the cup of suffering, wasn't ready. <laughs> Man, I should have saved this message for, for tomorrow. I, I, didn't, I wouldn't expect this to be this good. Listen, nobody was ready. Nobody, including Jesus. So, of course, it's going to be natural that when God starts speaking to you for you to think that you're not ready. But if you think you're not ready, why does God keep showing you dreams? Why does God keep speaking to you in visions? Why does God keep invading your night space? Why does he keep talking to you? Why? Why does he keep showing up? Why does he keep speaking to you? Because contrary to popular belief, you were ready before you thought you were. You were ready when God created you. He said, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you and caused you to be a prophet. The moment you... You excited that you decided that you were ready, but not the moment you was you were actually ready. It was not the same moment. The moment you finally accepted it was not the moment you were ready. God been caused you. That was your fire. That was your desire. The Bible says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. All I need you to do is to be willing and obedient. God will train you along the way. I feel the anointing this morning. God will train you along the way. He will give you a greater clarity. He will give you more information. Can I tell y'all something? Can I get can I get y'all one of my secrets? When I started pastoring, I didn't think I was ready. I said, God, you're calling me to help my generation. I have a burden for them. But if I can give you one of my secrets, I said, God, there's more I need to know. That every single day I was reading books, every single day I was doing research because I felt like I wasn't ready. Now, two years later, over 700 people have given their life back to Christ and rededicated their lives to Jesus. And we're leading a church of seven, almost 800 people of young people on fire for God. And, and it's crazy. Can I give you all one of my, it's crazy that every time somebody says, oh, you're the best pastor and I love you inside of me, there's still something that says, but I need to learn more. There's something inside of me that's saying, but I need to develop more. There's more that I need to grow in. You want to know why? Because it is human nature to always reject the cup that God has for you. Because you will always think you are not ready. And to be truthful, in your flesh, you aren't ready. But if you are ready to follow the Holy Spirit, if you are ready to follow God, 
If you are ready to follow what God is saying about you and about your life and about your assignment, then you are ready. I have way more preachers and intercessors on this line than what I know. I got pastors and prophets on this line, and I know I do. But some of us won't take the cup because we think we're not ready. And guess what? That's one of the prayers God won't answer. I'm like, nah, you're going to take this cup. I'm, I'm not taking it back. It's going to keep bothering you. I'm going to keep speaking to you. It's going to keep coming into your heart. Keep invading your dreams. Keep invading your night. Keep invading your visions. Keep invading your prayers. I'm going to keep over and over, over and over speaking to you because I'm not going to change. You are going to walk into your assignment. Woo! All right, last one. Last one that God can't answer. It's going to be the one. God can't answer the prayer when you ask him to remove the consequence. All right. God cannot answer when you ask him to remove the consequence. God cannot answer. I know this is this 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 is the one that's going to hurt a little bit. I know. Um because, you know, none of us want to talk about the fact that there are some things in our lives that we have made mistakes on, some things in our lives that we, we have we, we failed in, um, and we would rather God just, you know, really, really, not, really not deal with it. You know what I mean? It's, it's easier if God just looks over it um, and say, because I'm saved now, I don't, I don't have to deal with anything. But but I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you one verse, and I'm gonna go back to I'm gonna give you maybe an example in the Old Testament too. Let me do that. Galatians six and seven, it's King James. It says, "Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, I, I, I feel God. I feel that will he also reap." I'll give it to you New Living Translation for those who want a newer translation. It said, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice system of God. You will always harvest what you plant. This is, this is, this is better than you can type amen. I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm, I don't know. I might reteach this tomorrow. I might have to. I literally might have to. I don't know. You cannot mock the justice system of God. Look, let's, I'm, I'm going to go to 2 Samuel 12, verses 16 through 19. 2 Samuel 12, verses 16 through 19. Pay attention, all right? 2 Samuel 12, verses 16 through 19. I need you guys to pay attention to this. This is a story of David. After he sinned, he slept with uh, Bathsheba, who was Uriah's wife, and got her pregnant, and uh, he thought... He was going to try to get Uriah to go back to sleep with her so he can say, Uriah, it's your son, but he couldn't. So he had Uriah killed, which is terribly sinful. And now she's pregnant. So now Uriah is dead. He asked God to, to forgive him. And he think he just think he's going to just go back on with life. You know what I'm saying? Just, just go back on, live how you want to live, and do what you got to do. But let's look at what 2 Samuel 12 and 16. So Bathsheba's child, the child that she, that she was pregnant with, with David, do their sin. It says, David begged God to spare the child. 2 Samuel 12 and 16. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and to eat with them, but he refused. He literally laid on the floor in sackcloth and ashes, fasting, begging God, do not let me deal with the consequence. I know I made a mistake. I know I failed. But I do not want the consequence. Now, this is, this is, this is a strong word. Now, I'm not here to speak doom on anybody, all right? This is because David blatantly went against the presence of God, and this is a very, very strong, but God is not fond of this, okay? He was a king, and whenever you are a king, the sins of the king are a consequence on the nation, and you had a man killed under your king's authority because you wanted to hide the fact that you got his wife pregnant while he was fighting for you. 
So they begged him to get up, and he, he refused. Verse 18. Then on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen for, to reason while the child was ill, they said. What drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? Verse 19. I'm going to go through verse 20. When David saw them whispering, he realized what happened. Is the child dead, he asked. And they replied, he is dead. Verse 20. Then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on some lotion, and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshipped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. Look at the power in this. He laid on the floor for seven days in fasting and prayer. And he said, he begged God, God, please, please, God, don't let my child suffer. Do not punish me by this. Please. And him begging God to change his word would not happen. Because God told him, there's going to be a consequence for your sin, David. Now, now I need you to look at what David did. This is so powerful. This is powerful. I need you to get this. Hear me. David saw them talking. He said, did my son die? They said, uh, I said yeah, yeah, David, he's dead. I said, I said, David got up. Took a shower, got dressed, went to the temple, and worshipped. He worshipped. Now, this is what's powerful. This is what's powerful. Why did he worship? Because even though he didn't want it to happen, he realized that God was faithful. <laughs> Jesus. God had already told him what was going to happen. And he was trying to change God's mind. And most of y'all don't, y'all don't realize, man, you don't realize the power in this. Because he said, if God disciplined me, that means he still loves me. If God disciplined, if God didn't change his mind about my consequence, then it means he also didn't change his mind about my assignment. If God didn't change his mind about my consequence, then he also didn't change his mind about my purpose. If he didn't change his mind about my consequence, then he also didn't change his mind about my identity. If he didn't change his mind about my consequence, then he also didn't change his mind about my future. If he didn't change his mind about my consequence, then he also didn't change his mind about my faith. Come on. Come on. If the consequence is still here, then the promise is still here. So he went back and he worshiped. He said, God, this is why I can worship you. Because you're faithful. Because I know you still love me. Because I know you said that you chastise those who you love. And I know it hurt right now. But at least I can count on the fact that my father still loves me. That he has not left me nor forsaken me. That he's still here. That he could not be short of his word. That he could not change his mind. But he still loves me. He loves me still. He loves me. He loves me. He's faithful. He's faithful to the ages, through the ages. He's faithful to the end. That He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he, if he was faithful to the consequence that God, I know you would be faithful to the promise. You would be faithful. Let's just pray there. Father, I thank you today. I thank you that you're faithful. God, you are so faithful. It's so good to be able to rest in your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, oh God. It's new every morning. It's new every morning. You are more faithful than we know. You're so faithful, God. You were faithful in the consequence, but you were also faithful in the promise. You were faithful to our future, faithful to our potential, faithful to our destiny. God, and if you didn't change your mind about the consequence, you didn't change your mind about the assignment, 
And so it feels good, God, for the discipline because we know now that you love us. We know now. That's why you love us. That's why you show up as a father and sometimes that means discipline. Sometimes that means you got to get on us. But it's because you love us, oh God. It's because you love us. So help us to receive the love of the Holy Spirit. God, help us to receive your love. Help us to change our prayer on the day, God, so that we stop trying to pray against your will. Stop praying against your word. Stop praying against your way. God, we can just learn to trust what you have said. God, for whatever you have said is true. God, for your promises are yea and amen. God, that any promise you give to us, God, we will see it. We will live it out. In Jesus' name, God, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Oh, hallelujah. You are good and your mercy. Hallelujah. Your mercy endures forever. God, we accept our assignment. We accept our purpose on today. We accept it. Whatever you have for us, we accept it. Oh, Father, forgive us if we've ever delayed in obeying your will. Forgive us if we've ever delayed in saying yes to you. But today we say yes. And we use all of our influence to bring glory to your kingdom. All of it, every gift you've given to us to bring glory to you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I absolutely love you all. I pray that you guys be blessed. Just receive the love of God. I cover your day. I cover your week. Just be true today. Be transparent. Be real. Be unedited. Be honest. I love you. God loves you. And he didn't change his mind about you.